This is going to be an overview of the book of Daniel. The name Daniel means God is my judge. And the author of the book of Daniel is Daniel himself. And we find out this by reading Matthew 24, 15, which says, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. So right there, Jesus confirms that the author is Daniel. And you'll see that Daniel is a picture of not only Jesus Christ, but also the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the third member of the Godhead, while well, Daniel was made third ruler in the kingdom. And there's many pictures like that. Daniel had a royal bloodline, as you'll see in chapter 1, along with the other Hebrew boys. And the devil's idea was to get the kingly line into Babylon so that he could corrupt the seed. That's been his goal since Genesis 3.15. He thought if he could get that kingly line in Babylon and get it tainted by the heathens there, then he could stop the seed that would crush the serpent's head. So Daniel is taken to Babylon eight years before Ezekiel during the first invasion. So this book is written during the exile. And Jesus Christ is seen in this book as the fourth man in the fire. That's Daniel 3.25. And a very simple breakdown is Daniel 1 through 7 shows the history of Gentile nations. 8 through 12 shows restoration of Israel. But let's break it down even further and start in chapter 1. You see the children of Israel taken into captivity by King Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel 1.1 1, 1, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, under Jerusalem, and besieged it. So the ne Nebuchadnezzar wanted them to bring the best of the children of Israel to stand in the king's palace, but they must go through some satanic indoctrination when they get there. And Daniel 1, 3 through 4 says, And the king spake unto Hashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, and of the king's seed, and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored, and skillful in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge, and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. So they wanted the best the children of Israel had, and they wanted to teach them the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. They wanted to give them the wisdom of men. 1 Corinthians 2, five says that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You see, God doesn't care nothing about the wisdom of men. But the children of Israel that stood out like a sore thumb above the rest were Daniel Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And most people didn't know the, la the three boys by these names. You know them by their names in verse 7. In Daniel 1, 7, it says, Unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. Everyone knows them by Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They don't know Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. See, once Babylon got a hold of them, they changed their names. You don't want anyone to take away your good name. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 7, 1, A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death and the day of one's birth. And Daniel, he didn't want to defile himself with the king's meat. In Daniel 1.8, it says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. So Daniel is a great example for us even today. Don't defile yourself with the world's junk. You don't have to watch what they watch. You don't have to listen to what they listen to. You don't have to play the video games that they play. These four children of Israel, 
were found better than all the magicians and astrologers in his realm. And God's men are always better than the devil's men throughout the Bible. And you saw that with Moses and Aaron versus the magicians in Exodus. You saw that with the apostles versus Simon the sorcerer. The world may have flashy things, catchy music and things like that. But God's men win. Now in chapter 2 you have Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And he must have been eating too many Doritos before he went to sleep that night. He must have woke up sweating from this dream. In Daniel 2.1 it says, In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. So Nebi brings all the magicians and astrologers and soothsayers and Chaldeans in there so that they can interpret the dream. But if they can't interpret it, then they get cut in pieces. This goes to show you that the world just uses you if they can get something out of you. It's like these musicians. They use you until they can't make money, then they cut you off. Actors do. They use you, and when they can't do it anymore, they just cut you off. Athletes, same way. When you get old and broke down, and you can't do it anymore, then what? As long as you work for the flesh, the world, and the devil, they will hook you up materially. Daniel 2.6, But if you show the dream and the interpretation, you shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. So Nebuchadnezzar seems to have a problem remembering the dream himself. So he wants the magicians to not only interpret the dream, but also tell the dream as well. And they're like, nobody on earth can do that. And they say in verse 11, And it is a rare thing that the king requireth, and there is none other that can show it before the king, except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. So there they admit that there are gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. At least these guys are smarter than your average atheist today. They may not believe in one true God of the Bible, but they realize there is something otherworldly out there. So Nebuchadnezzar decides he's going to kill all the wise men, the magicians, and <clears throat> all these intellectual guys of Babylon. And this would include Daniel and his friends. So Daniel makes a request to see the king and to give the interpretation. So Daniel goes straight to his friends to get a prayer chain going. In Daniel 2, 17 through 19, it says, Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows could not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed. So Daniel goes on to brag about the Lord and says in verse 22, He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. Now this is the verse that gave me the idea to do the Deep and Secret Things series that I plan on doing more of one day. But do you ever stop and think about the things that God knows? He knows the deep and secret things. He knows what's in the bottom of the ocean. He knows about animals we haven't even discovered yet. He knows if there is really a Loch Ness Monster, a Bigfoot, and any other paranormal stuff. He knows what is outside of this earth. He knows what is being done in secret with men in the government who work with devils. And he knows these deep and secret things. And one day we will have a mind like Christ. We will be like him for we shall see him as he is. And we'll know what's going on everywhere. Knowing the dream of Nebuchadnezzar and the interpretation of the dream was nothing for the Lord. Notice how Daniel is going to give God the credit for revealing this deep and secret thing. In Daniel 2, 27 and 28, Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the King Nebuchadnezzar, what shall be in the latter days? Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. So Daniel goes on to tell Nebuchadnezzar the dream and the interpretation. So let's look at the dream. 
you have the head of gold. The head of gold is Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar, as it says in Daniel 2.38. You have the breast and arms of silver. That's the media Persian Empire. You have the belly of brass, the Grecian Empire. You have the legs of iron, the Roman Empire. Then you have the part iron and part clay that has to do with the mingling of the sons of God with women as it happened in the days of Noah in Genesis 6. It happens once again in the future. Then finally, you have the stone cut out of the mountain. This is the universal kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that was the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Daniel told the dream and the interpretation. So Daniel is promoted in the kingdom. And Daniel goes back, probably goes back to his bachelor pad there and tells Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego the good news. And he hooks them up too. In Daniel 2, 48 through 49, it says, Then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Then Daniel requested of the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. Now in chapter 3, when Nebuchadnezzar sups up his golden image, he wants everyone to bow down and worship it, or they will get thrown into a furnace of fire. And this reminds you of the mark of the beast and the Antichrist and the tribulation. Because if you don't bow down to the beast and take his mark then you're getting your head chopped off. So, Nebi has his favorite bands come in, and they play some music, and and the people hear the sound of the music. When they hear it, they have to bow down to the golden image. Just like the singers and rappers today, when they perform, <coughs> the crowd gives glory to a god that isn't the god of all gods. They put up their cigarette lighters in the air, they wave their hands, and they cry and shout. Daniel 3 7 therefore at that time when all the people hear when all the people heard the sound of the cornet flute harp sagbut psaltery and all kinds of music all the people the nations and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up so I guarantee you there's going to be a time in the future when the antichrist he's going to play music and when that people that nation hears that music. They're going to all fall down simultaneously and worship the Antichrist. Then the Chaldeans snitched on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There were a bunch of snitches. And they snitched on them for not bowing down to the image. Even though they should have a right not to bow down if they don't want to. If those other guys want to bow down to the golden image and be stupid and hold up Black Lives Matter signs and rainbow LGBT signs and pro-choice signs, then have at it. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had a little bit more sense than that. They didn't want to bow down to no image. They knew that God in heaven was the one whom they should fear. Who the, He's the one who they should bow down to in Daniel three seventeen and 18. It says, If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thine hand O king but if not be it known unto thee O king that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up notice that they said but if not there is always a chance that god won't deliver you <coughs> when i'm in a scary situation i say lord help me but if you don't want to, I understand, and you know best. Say, but if not, you're still God. A lot of times people say, God is going to get me through this. Or the other day, for example, this guy said he was called to preach. And a woman said, if you're called to preach, then the Lord will give you a wife who won't leave you. I mean, it's good that they have so much faith in the Lord. But sometimes God lets bad things happen to good people. Sometimes to leave a testimony to others and makes us suffer to make us stronger. He lets bad things happen to us for those reasons. You can't just always say, He will do this or that for me. Have faith He will, but it's better to say, Lord willing. 
because it may not be the Lord's will for you to be healed or to keep living or to have this or that. James 4.15 says, for, for that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. So say, Lord willing. Nebuchadnezzar was so mad about those three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that he heated up the furnace seven times more than it usually is and got his most mighty men to grab them and throw them in. He must have thought they were some pretty rough old boys if he needed to get his most mighty men to bind them up. But the heat was so hot that it burned up the mighty men. Nebuchadnezzar wasn't too smart at this time because he done killed his most mighty men. But then something miraculous happened, and God did deliver Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It didn't burn them. And Nebuchadnezzar sees a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ in the fire with them. In Daniel 3.24, it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonied, and rose up in haste, and spake, and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king, he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. So Nebi is so astonied that he gives the boys the right to serve their own God, and they don't have to worship the golden image. Daniel 3.28, Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath set his angel, who hath sent his angel, and delivered his servant that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word, and yielded their bodies, that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. In chapter 4, you see Nebuchadnezzar praising God. He got his eyes opened a bit. Daniel 4, 1 through 3. Nebuchadnezzar the king, and to all people, nations, languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. How great are his signs, and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion from generation to generation. He kind of reminds me of someone like Kanye West. One minute he's saying, F you. And then the next minute he's supposedly a pastor. Then the next minute he's doing Black Lives Matter protest stuff. Then the next minute he's doing Sunday services. Then the next minute he's hanging out with wicked rappers like Travis Scott. And you get the feeling that maybe he is kind of nuts. And then sometimes you think, well, maybe this guy is kind of sincere even though he's crazy. He's just a weird character. Uh... In chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar has another dream. He must have been eating too much buffalo wild wings again. Because he must have been tossing and turning around all night with this dream. He didn't learn from the lost, from the last time that he shouldn't go to the world for an answer. Or for an interpretation. Yet he does it again. He calls in you know, all the magicians and people like that. You know, these guys who are hooked up with unclean spirits. The same ones who entertain people to, today on America's Got Devils. I mean, Got Talent. Although these guys probably really were hooked up with the devil to the point that they could work a few miracles back in Daniel's day. But then Daniel came in and Nebuchadnezzar said that Daniel had the spirit of the holy gods in him. So you see, Nebuchadnezzar has come a long way. He knew there was a Holy Spirit in Daniel. But Nebuchadnezzar still was a spiritual baby, and his doctrine was all messed up. So he said the spirit of the holy gods. He needs to recognize that there is only one God. He needs to get his doctrine right on that. But Daniel interprets the dream, and it isn't in Nebuchadnezzar's favor. He pro prophesies how Nebuchadnezzar, will be like one of the beasts of the field, like a crazy person. He prophesied how Nebuchadnezzar will act like a beast for seven years. And this will match the tribulation because that is where men will act like a bunch of animals for seven years. And that is where the beast will show up, the, the Antichrist. And Nebuchadnezzar is a type of that Antichrist. Daniel 4, 28 through 30. 
All this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of twelve months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power for the honor of my majesty? Notice, Nebuchadnezzar back to his old ways, still very prideful. I guess that would be a huge temptation for a man who had anything he wanted. But pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Look what's going to happen to him. Daniel 4.31 While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times, that be seven years, shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagles' feathers, and his nails like birds' claws. The good thing about Nebuchadnezzar is after all this, he praised God, and he didn't curse God. Daniel 4.34, And at the end of days I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes into heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. In chapter 5, you see the great story about the handwriting on the wall. And this is where you get the phrase, the handwriting is on the wall. And this one guy said, I got fired and didn't even see it coming. And the other guy said, well, the handwriting was all over the wall. You see, that's where you get that common saying that people use today. When and now in chapter 5, actually, it happens in history after chapter 7 and 8. And in this chapter, you're introduced to a new king in this chapter, King Belshazzar. He was a party animal. He had judgment coming but couldn't read the handwriting on the wall. He didn't even see the handwriting on the wall. Daniel 5.2, Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives, and his concubines might drink therein. So this guy is a crazy nut. He's drinking alcohol out of the vessels that was taken out of the house of God. He's an idiot. Look at what they're doing while they drink. Daniel 5, 4. They drink wine and praise the gods of gold, of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. They are praising gods that can't see, hear, or walk. They're praising a god that they would have to pick up and carry, just like they had to pick up and carry Dagon. Daniel 5, 5 and 6. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and rode over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his loins were loosed, and his knees smote one against another. And this is where you get the saying, He got so scared his knees knocked. So Belshazzar was scared stupid. And he was already dumb anyway. But just living for the flesh, that's what a lot of people do is live for the flesh. Drinking, smoking, eating, being lazy, sleeping constantly. And when they are awake, they only think of entertainment. That was Belshazzar. Belshazzar does just like Nebuchadnezzar when he needs something interpreted. Look where he goes when he needs something interpreted. In Daniel 5, 7, The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. And the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. So he's going to the world for help. You don't want to go to the world for help. Go to the word of God. Go to your pastor. Don't go to the world. Don't go to a psychiatrist. Don't go to a TV preacher. Go to the King James Bible 
and a Bible-believing preacher. Daniel 5, 8. Then came in all the king's wise men, but they could not read the writing, nor make known to the king the interpretation thereof. Big surprise. They got everybody in there, and nobody could figure it out. A handwriting expert probably came in and couldn't get it. The psychic couldn't get it. Now the queen comes in and lets Belshazzar know that his father, Nebuchadnezzar, knew this Bible, knew this Bible preacher named Daniel, who he nicknamed Belteshazzar. And this guy could tell you anything you wanted to know. She says in Daniel 5.11, There is a man in thy kingdom, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, was found in him, whom the king Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, the king, I say, thy father made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. For as much as an excellent spirit, knowledge, and understanding, interpreting of dreams, and showing of hard incidences, and dissolving of doubts, were found in the same Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. Wouldn't it be something if people came to you for the answer to the questions of life? Are you in the book enough and spiritual enough and right with God enough to give an answer with book, chapter, and verse straight from the Bible at the drop of a hat? First Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Are you ready to give an answer to every man about any question they could throw at you? Verse 16 through 17 gives you a good look at the character of Daniel. It says, And I have heard of thee that thou canst make interpretations and dissolve doubts. Now if thou canst read the writing and make known to me the interpretation thereof, thou shalt be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about thy neck and shalt be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered before the king, Let thy gifts be to thyself and give thy rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing unto the king and make known to him the interpretation. So he said, I don't need your jewelry. I don't need your rewards or gifts. That's against code of conduct as a lot of, at a lot of places anyway to accept gifts like that. So I'll tell you what, it says for free. So just like these studies I put on YouTube, they're for free. And don't get me, don't get the wrong idea. I don't think they're good. I don't think they are the greatest. But one thing about them is that they are free. I'll tell you what the Bible says for free. I'll show you how to study and read it for yourself so that the common man can know what it says. And I'll put it out for free so that the common man can get his hands on it without spending his hard-earned money. There's no need in charging $10 for every study and every sermon that you put out. I mean, that's my opinion. In the days we're living in, you could put out all your studies on YouTube absolutely free and let the whole world see them. You would have people hearing it that would never pay $40 for it. People just aren't going to spend that kind of money on that. But you want to get the message out. Right? I like what Danny Castle said one time. He said, charging for sermons? What's that? I'd pay somebody to listen to me. You see, it's, it's cheap to put out these studies. All I have to pay for is the internet and the stuff that I use to make the videos and to distribute them is n no cost. You can buy a hundred pack of CDs for $15 and you can make it an MP3 CD and put just about every study I have on it on just one CD. You can get a USB flash drive thing and load it down with every sermon you have and give it to somebody for 5 to $10 that you spent. If we are close enough to the end, then we need to get the message out and not charge so much money for the truth. I mean, I understand people that have to charge maybe to get more books printed or to get the CDs made, but just constantly, everything that you do, you want money for it. That's not good. Daniel is going to give the interpretation of the handwriting on the wall. Daniel 5, 24 through 28. Then was part of the hand sent from him, and this writing was written. 
And this is the writing that was written. Many, many tickle you farson. This is the interpretation of the thing. Many God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tickle, thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. Paris, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. So Belshazzar has been laid in the balances and found wanting. He didn't cut it. When God went to weigh his works, he was lacking. So he was going to end up dead and taken over by the Medes and Persians. But man, this guy Belshazzar took the negative preaching like a champ. He still rewarded Daniel instead of cutting his head off or something. So Daniel 5.29 then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet, <coughs> and put a chain of gold about his neck, and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. So even though Daniel said to keep his gifts to himself, he got the gifts anyway. Belshazzar, a heathen king, gives Daniel, a godly man, these gifts and promotes him. And Proverbs 16, 7 says, When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Daniel 5, 30. In that night was Belshazzar the king of the Chaldeans slain. So what Daniel says really does come to pass, and this shows that he's a true prophet. And verse 31 says, And Darius the Median took the kingdom, being about three score and two years old. So in chapter 6, we get into the most famous story in the book of Daniel. Probably even more famous than the three men in the fiery furnace. And in chapter 6, what you see is Daniel in the den of lions. King Darius has made Daniel in charge over the whole realm. The other presidents and princes sought out to find something wrong with Daniel because they were so jealous. Daniel 6, 4, then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. They could find none occasion nor fault, for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. When someone doesn't like you, they would dig up dirt on you. They probably did a background check on him, looked through all of his social media profiles, and seen if he had any old selfies when he was a younger man doing something sinful, or they probably hired a private investigator. They probably snuck onto his laptop and checked his search history. But they couldn't find anything wrong with Daniel. And that should be your goal. The world is watching you every day. It should be your goal to, let, to not let them find anything wrong with your life. So they came to the conclusion that the only way to get him in trouble is by making it a crime to worship God. And that's what they want to do now. They can't get you in trouble any other way if you're a Bible-believing Christian. The only way they can get you in trouble is to make it a crime to be a Bible-believing Christian. And that's what they did to Daniel. Daniel was a saint of God. He was a Bible-believing saint. He believed the Bible that he had. He didn't have all the Bible, but he believed what he had. In Daniel 6, 5, it said, Then said these men, We shall, find, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So here was their suggestion to the king. They said, Let soever, that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for thirty days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. So they knew if they made a law that you couldn't pray to God for thirty days, then Daniel would finally be found breaking a law. And look what Daniel did as, as soon as he found out. In Daniel 16, it says, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. He had guts. He wasn't afraid of their new stupid law. He said, I'm praying anyways. And they probably... And they was probably watching him through the window. So Daniel prayed anyways. And then he probably went to, to Walmart, got some groceries, and prayed in the aisle. Went down the wrong side of the aisle just for spite and didn't even have a mask on right in front of all of them. And when those stupid laws are made, the law-abiding citizens look like rebels. And they got these snitches. Daniel 6.11 
Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. So check out these peeping toms. They must have had binoculars or something watching Daniel. They went and snitched on him. If there's anything that's annoying, it's a snitch. They told the King Darius, and since the law couldn't be altered, Darius had to have Daniel thrown into the den of lions. <coughs> In Daniel 6.14, then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Darius wasn't right with God, but he knew Daniel was a God-fearing preacher of righteousness. In Daniel 6.16, Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. So this lost king has more faith than many Christians do. He knew Daniel would be delivered. In Daniel six twenty two and 23, it says, My God hath sent his angel, and hath shut the lion's mouth, that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him innocency was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Then was the king exceeding glad for him, and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no manner of hurt was found upon him, because he believed in his God. So he believed that even though man's law was against him talk, uh, talking to his God, he could talk to God anyway, and God would see him through it. Now Daniel chapter 7. You have Daniel seeing the four beasts, the bear, the lion, the leopard, and the fourth beast, which was great and terrible and diverse from the other beasts. And you have what looks like to be a prophecy of the great white throne judgment also in this chapter, with the Lord, the Ancient of Days, sitting on the throne with the books open. You see, Daniel 7, 9, and 10, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, <coughs> and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool, his throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. So you, there you got like a prophecy of the great white throne judgment. In chapter 8, you have Daniel's vision of the ram and the he goat. The ram is... Medo-Persia, with the horns being Darius and Cyrus. The he-goat is the Grecian Empire, with the great horn being Alexander the Great. And the four horns is the four kingdoms of Greece. And Daniel also talks about the Antichrist in this chapter. In Daniel eight twenty-three through 25, it says, And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance, an understanding dark sentences, shall stand up, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper in practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. That's a prophecy of the Antichrist that Daniel gives there. And in Daniel chapter 9, we find that Daniel was a reader. Daniel 9, 2, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the Lord would come to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So how was your reading life? Daniel was a reader. And the Bible says in 1 Timothy four thirteen, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. So in chapter 9, you're also seeing Gabriel again, one of the only angels mentioned by name in the Bible. You see, he, he is an angel. He is a male who flies without wings. Daniel 9, 21, Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. Now, this is interesting. Gabriel is come to give Daniel skill and understanding. He probably called him Danielson, like Mr. Miyagi. So he gives him skill 
and understanding. Daniel 9, 22, And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. So Gabriel goes on to explain to Daniel about the 70 weeks. Daniel 9.25 Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So remember that each week equals seven years. So 70 weeks is 70 weeks of seven years which would equal 490 years total. So from the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, that is, the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, that's the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, to the first coming of Christ, you have 483 years. Jesus shows up 483 years after they start rebuilding the temple. And... In what you read about in Ezra and Nehemiah when they're rebuilding the temple in the wall, 483 years after that, Jesus Christ shows up. But 483 years only equals 69 weeks. So it stops at 69 weeks, and you have a postponement with around 2,000 years of the church age, and there's still one week left. This week is fulfilled in the tribulation, which is seven years long, which would be a week specifically Daniel's 70th week. So since they rejected Jesus Christ at the first coming, the ticker stopped at 483 years, which is 69 weeks, and it's postponed because of their rejection. But the time starts ticking again in the tribulation, which is Daniel's 70th week. So there's 490 years from Ezra and Nehemiah to the second coming of Jesus Christ, which is 70 weeks. With that big gap of history in there that we are living in now. Where the Lord stopped counting it. We are in a postponement stage. Now Daniel 10. Daniel has a vision by the river. And we see a vision of a man whose appearance was as the appearance of lightning. And he talks about how the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood him. But Michael, the archangel, helped him out. So maybe the prince of Persia here is referring to an unclean spirit withstanding Daniel. Daniel eleven twenty one. he talks about the Antichrist again. And it says, And his estate shall stand up a vile person, to whom they shall not give the honor of thy kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and attain, obtain the kingdom by flattery. So watch people who <coughs> are all about peace. And are always flattering people. He obtains the kingdom by flatteries. In Daniel 9, 11, 36 through 38. And the king shall do according to his will. And he shall exalt himself. That's the Antichrist. He's going to stand in the holy place claim to be God. He's going to magnify himself above every God. And shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods. He's going to blaspheme God. And shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, so that's why they say he's going to be a homosexual, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. That's why he'll get rid of the Roman Catholic Church, because he wants all the worship to be about him. So, even though he's going to work with the Roman evil Roman Catholic Church a little bit, He's going to end up getting rid of the, the Catholics because, you know, he wants all the worship for himself. So the evil man gets rid of other evil people as well, just so he can get all the worship. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. So he... He shall, he sh uh, in his estate shall he honor the God of forces. That's where they get the force be with you. But in chapter 12, you hear about the time of the end. And you hear more about Michael, who stands for Israel. And this hints that a nation can have an angel assigned to it. 
Daniel 12, 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered. And every one that, sh shall, that shall be found written in the book. So Daniel has told some things and sees some things, but he has to seal them up. And the saints won't get any wisdom on it until the time of the end. Daniel 12, 4. But thou, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. So there are some things in the Bible that haven't been figured out yet. The more time goes on, the more things that are revealed to the saints. It says, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. This could be a prophecy about modern-day transportation and technology. Knowledge has increased. Uh, men are so knowledgeable about things that they, that they can almost do anything now. Knowledge has increased, and men run to and fro. That's the modern-day transportation. You can leave today and be across the country by the end of the day. But so th these things prove that the Bible is real. And that's the end of this overview of the book of Daniel. I hope it's whets your appetite for this book. And I hope you'll go and read it and study it for yourself.